Well, thanks very much for inviting me to be here. Um, you know, my background, I'm not sure if you <coughs> know sort of what the connection is, but uh, back about oh, a little over 10 years ago, I was the chief architect for high performance computing at Sun, working for Shaheen, before Sun decided didn't that need that whole team, one of those little layoffs. But um, had a good time then. I went to supercomputing, I think, in 2012, 2013. Um, since then, I went to work for eBay for a while, spent seven years at Netflix as the cloud architect, and uh, in January, I joined Battery Ventures, a VC firm. And I'm going to just briefly say who are Battery Ventures. It's, it's a fairly large VC firm, been around for about 30 years, and lots of investments. Um, it's currently investing a $900 million fund across lots of different high technologies. Uh, we're going to share these uh, slides with you. So. Um, and the fund is a 10-year life cycle. We start a new fund about every three years, um, and the funds get bigger and bigger and bigger. So each fund is typically a little bit bigger than the previous fund, and it runs for a 10-year cycle. Most of that money gets invested in the first two or three years, and then uh, you start another fund and it keeps going like that. So I think we, invest, we made 30-ish investments last year and invested about $350 million, which places us about the 10th biggest VC in terms of activity for 2013. Here's some of our, our current portfolio companies. Um, Blue Jeans Network's an interesting one. That's video conferencing, Fastly's CDN. Um, there's networking, there's storage, security, lots of cool companies. Um, but rather than just looking at what the company does, I'm going to tell you what, what I do. I, I have a, a slightly strange role. I'm not a regular VC partner in the firm. Um, regular VCs do a lot of um, due diligence, and then they figure out the financial parts of the deal, then they sit on the board of directors, and they do all that kind of stuff. So I don't do those things. What I do is a lot more outbound, uh, going and making contacts with people like yourselves, uh, making contacts with companies, and uh, then supporting the portfolio. So what I've been doing this year I'm kind of a bit crazy on um, doing presentations. I've done 40 public presentations. This is one of them, but you know, at conferences, I've done 26 internal talks at, you know, where there's like one company but a room full of people, um, and a bunch of interviews and podcasts and things like that. So what I've been doing is building up enterprise IT relationships of CIOs, CTOs of big banks and big companies and people, everything from sort of Apple to Capital One to uh, Otto, which is a German um, retailer, VMware, and I've also built up strong relationships with Amazon Web Services and Google in particular, the Google Cloud people, sort of working on how to figure, understanding what they can do to support our portfolio companies. Then I work on the deals, the right-hand side uh, batch of companies here. These are companies I've worked on like Nitro and AppDynamics and Cask and BlueJeans. I spent a lot of time with BlueJeans. Recently, they're working on scalability, availability, and moving part of their infrastructure to cloud. So that's what they do as a sort of supporting the portfolio. Some of the uh, smaller companies, um, Vivid Cortex is MySQL performance management. Uh, Gardecore is a uh, SDN security company based out of Israel. We have a strong office in Israel, and I've visited there a couple of times. So having an interesting time looking around Europe, we have a big office in Boston. So what does this look like? If you look at... Uh, the, if, if you're trying to deal with, uh, interact with the VC firm, what does it look like? This is a sort of a rough, rounded off kind of number. A, a, a company like Battery meets with approximately 5,000 different companies a year. That's not meetings, that's the number of different organizations that they will meet with, 5,000, right? Out of that, two or 300 turn into what we call hot deals, which means that we're interested enough to do some research We'll, we'll write up all the memos, we'll call some references, uh, we'll, we'll, you'll come in and do an actual pitch right, to the company and we'll look, think about whether we want to do that deal. Out of that two or 300, about 10% of them turn into new investments. So there's about 30 new investments each year. There are follow-on rounds for previous investments that I don't count here, but if you're coming in as a new entrepreneur with a new idea, this is kind of what it looks like. You're one of those 5,000 people. It's fairly easy to get a meeting with a VC to just discuss something with them. And you should, it's easy to do that. You should definitely do that. But that's a different thing from the pitch meeting where you come in and say, please actually give me money, right? And then 
the probability that, uh, you know, that you're actually going to get the money is maybe 10% of that. So that's just to give you some context. So let's look at the life cycle. What does it take to go through it? And I ended up sort of writing through this and ended up most of the life cycle is around the birth end of the life cycle because that's the hardest part. Uh, and, and I came up with this sort of thought, which is, um, is that, that startups are actually like premature babies in an incubator, right? You, you've had a bunch of um, you know, miscarriages on the way there. There's been, it's, it's kind of, it gets a bit gory, but you know, for, it, it tends to be a very male-oriented thing to do startups. And it's because women already do a startup whenever they have a family. That's kind of <laughs> just going through the process of setting up a family and having kids is actually probably the best analogy to it. So, I mean, on a slightly different level. But they're hard to conceive, hard to birth, and if you don't give them constant attention, they'll die. That's, this is like they're in an incubator. You're not sure if they're going to really take off. And that is normal for a startup. So it is a very, very stressful thing. I mean, having kids is a very stressful thing. There's a lot of work involved. So how can we get through that? I'm trying to give you some, some guidelines that will actually lead you through this process. And the first one is just networking. Just get to know people that work at startups or that are in the VC community. That means, you know, that means entrepreneurs, CEOs, CTOs, founding teams. Anyone that's been on a founding team knows how to work with the VC community. They will probably move in and out of VC firms. There might be an entrepreneur residence at some time. They might have been a VC. So this community of startups and people that work at VCs, why, are the, why would they be interested in talking to you? Now, if you're in part of the HPC community, you should be a go-to expert on something. Like the person that knows how InfiniBand really works. The person that knows how to do, I don't know, large matrix solvers or, or some kind of um, sort of technique that might be useful. Or you know how, to, or you've built a, you know, some you know, 10,000 node, uh, 10,000 CPU, you know, high performance computer. You've done something, right? There's some expert thing that you are an expert in that they should find interest in and you can go talk to them. So you become the person they go to when they want to talk to somebody about that expertise. So that's, that is kind of how I got into it. I was at Netflix, I was doing cloud computing. I became one of the go-to people for anyone in the VC community who wanted an opinion on a cloud-related company, cloud, NoSQL, all those kinds of things. So that worked for me. And the other thing is just be generally helpful and don't expect anything immediately in return. It's a sort of concept of paying it forward. If you keep being helpful to people, eventually they will be helpful back and you're creating a sort of a large sort of uh, goodwill debt around yourself that you can pay, that you can claim, uh, you can, you're basically building a credit that you can cash in later. But don't try and cash that in early. Just keep trying to be as helpful as possible and things will eventually figure out. If you're looking for an idea that's going to turn into a company, as part of these discussions, listen for something that resonates. Listen for something that people prick up their ears, they want to talk to you about. You know, what is the hot area? And try and move your expertise to be a specialist in something that, that's whatever the hot area is. And what you're really trying to do here is build friendships in this community and build trust in this community. Because at some point, you're going to say, give me some money. And if they don't know who you are and they don't trust you, all they're going on is the idea and then they don't know if it's the right, you know, they don't know you. If they know you and there's a good idea, that's, that's the winning combination. So you need to find that community. So there is a huge number of VC firms. There's a huge number of people in the VC community. How do you find the right ones? Well, there's this concept called an investment thesis. And if you go to any VC firm's website and you look at the different investors, they will quite often talk about their investment thesis. Or if you look at what they've invested in, you can figure out from that, they're investing in storage companies around flash, right? They're investing in mobile companies because mobile is replacing all of the desktop apps. You get mobile first applications that there's a perfectly good desktop app, perfectly good multi-billion dollar business. They get cleaned out by a mobile app, right? Um, you've seen infrastructure as a service replacing data center, you're playing SaaS, replace package software. These are sort of the large changes in the industry, huge changes and each of these changes spawns a huge number of startups. So, so from, as a VC company, you're looking for what are the investment thesis, which of these areas are you investing in, and then you'll have a sprinkling of startups that are around that space, right? So you're looking for somebody who has a similar investment thesis that makes sense to what, whatever you're an expert in, okay? And this is just some examples of the kind of things that uh, 
like that. I mean, what we saw maybe 10 years ago was the growth of what, you know, in the HPC world was called Beowulf clusters, right? Commodity clusters replacing dedicated supercomputers. And later on, you know, the, the enterprise industry went, hey, we could do that too. We can run on lots of little cheap Linux machines, and we can run business critical workloads on Linux on, on x86. That was something that sort of originally started in the HPC world and moved across to, to um, the enterprise world. Okay, so you've got a rough idea of, the, of what, who you should be talking to, which VCs you should be getting to be friends with. The next thing is you've got, you've got to find something to hang the idea on. You know, what is the pain point? What's the problem? And it should really ideally be something you've experienced because you're getting your deep inside knowledge of it. But also it's got to be something that more than, you know, lots of people need to be fixed. You've got to find a big market for it. And it comes in sort of three different categories, either something that could never have been done before, something that was just too expensive to do before, or something that they can do now, but the current solution just isn't cutting it, right? It's flaky, it's broken, it's, you know, it's, it's busted in some way, because you can come in with the slightly better mousetrap and clean out a market, right, if, if you get it right. So that's more about execution, whereas, or having a completely new idea or a completely, you know, a, a radically cheaper idea. Those are the kinds, three sort of buckets that I'd put ideas into. So try and understand which of those you're going for. If you can get more than one, as, then it, then it helps. It, obviously, you've got more advantage. So there's definitely a problem here. You've got some idea, there's a market, you've got some expertise in it. So the next problem is, why is it, why are you going to be the team, and the, why is your company going to be the one that wins? Like, you have to have an unfair advantage, right? Otherwise, you know, somebody else will just pick, take the business or the, an incumbent will just go, oh, we'll just launch a product that does that, right? Or they'll fix whatever problem they've got. So you're typically, your unfair advantage comes from having something that's a disruptive business model. The incumbents can't go there. You look at, you know, if you look at the innovator's dilemma, uh, if you're invested in a certain market with a certain sales model, a disruptive sales model is one which, which you know, is undermining that, right? It's, it's coming in at a totally different price point, totally different delivery point. If they tried to switch and launch that product, it would undermine their own sales force. So that's why disruptive business models come in and little startups come in and replace the main companies. Quite often, if you're in this space, if you're deep technologies, you have a unique experience on the team. You have the world expert in something, right? Or you have somebody that's built something before, you, you know, repeat experience is useful. Um, you've, got, you've figured out some kind of strategic advantage. You've got a better strategy. Somebody else is, is being very tactical. You've got a better strategy. We'll talk a bit about strategy later. Um, you can go faster. Startups can move faster. Big companies that have really long product cycles that take a year to get into anything out, if you can get in there and do an agile development and get stuff and crank out versions every week, that's why speed of execution tends to win. That's another reason why you see SaaS companies replacing on-premise software. On-premise software, you, you spend forever building it. It's got to be perfect. You give it to the customer. They leave it on the shelf for six months because they're using the old version. And maybe two years after you baked this code, they try it out, right? It takes forever to get that. And then they, you find out whether it worked or not. With a SaaS product, you can change it every day, every week. You find out immediately whether something works. You, you, the speed at which you learn about your customers is two orders of magnitude better typically. And that's why SaaS companies are so agile and why they can learn so much. So take something that's infrastructure, move it to SaaS, and that is a, 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 a standard pattern that VCs and everyone recognizes as a, as a way to speed up execution and get yourself a strategic advancer. And a lot of people focus on, hey, I've got patents in something. That's helpful. And it might be needed, but unless you've got a billion dollars to take it to, to, to pay your lawyers, it does not really going to work. You're going to lose to whoever's got the big, big budget, right? The pat patents are not, are not it. So I see people focusing, hey, we've got some patents. You know, that should be the last thing on your list, right? Yes, I've got some patents in this thing. That's just sort of keeping, keeping it tidy for when you're a big company, you'll, be, you'll want those patents. But the patents don't help you launch an idea. They help you defend it in five years, right? Okay, so you've got your advantage, you're going to win, then you've got to go and persuade somebody to give you some money. So how do you do that? First thing is VCs are happy to talk to people, but make sure they understand this isn't the pitch, this is just brainstorming. It's one of the most fun things that happens in the VC world, is you get a few entrepreneurs coming in to just 
cover a whiteboard in ideas, and you, it's a very interactive process. It's great fun. Um, find some, it also helps select. If they won't talk to you, they're not interested in this space. So you've already found some friends. You've found some VCs that are interested in this space, and they're interested in brainstorming. Now, if you get very, well, I can't share my idea because they might steal it, you know, you're not going to get anywhere. You have to basically, you've already got, your team is, gonna, is the reason it's going to win, not because your idea is secret, right? Sharing the idea and developing it is part of getting the trust with the VCs. So find those, and then also ask those VCs, who else? You know, if they say, well, you know, this is a great idea, but it's not really in our space, right? You want to say, who else was in that space? There's a lot of collaboration amongst the VC community. It isn't a lone person. There isn't a lot of competition where we say, I'm going to hold on to this. I'm not sharing it with anyone else. What you tend to see is VCs collaborating. That somebody be a lead, and there'll be a second or a third person in a particular funding round. It's, it's quite rare that it's a single VC doing an investment. So what they do is, you know, we work across companies. And if you are talking to somebody and you're brainstorming, they'll say, well, this guy at this VC, he has exactly this, um, exactly this investment thesis. And we have the same thesis, but we've already invested in a competitor that's a bit too close to it. We don't want to have on our books two people who are close together. But this guy hasn't done an investment in this space. So you, quite often, you'll get cross-references, and you'll find the companies that they like to work with. So if you're trying to invest in like battery and light speed or, or Excel and, you know, and um, Andreessen and Horowitz or something like that, right? There are a number of companies that are used to working together and there are partners that like each other that quite often work together. So you'll end up with two people on the board, right? And, and you'll get a, a mixed round. And, that's that, and you, what you're really doing when you get a VC on the board of your company is you're getting access to a very well-developed network of talent and references. The other thing is, you know, where do they see the gaps in the market? We see, you know, these 5,000 companies that come by every year are all sprinkled across different parts of the market. You're, by talking to VCs and brainstorming, you're saying, no, these guys are already doing this. These guys are doing this. Hey, there's a gap here. Like, I, there seems to, yeah, I, don't, I haven't heard of anyone doing something in this space, right? So generally, we have a fair idea of who is going around. Even if we don't invest in every company that comes by, we get some idea of what's going on in the space. So this is, keep doing this, and then until you'll find your gap, you're, you're preconditioning and you're discovering which VCs you actually want to pitch to, because you really only want to pitch to a handful of people. You don't want to be trawling up and down Central Road talking to 30 different VCs. That's not a good strategy. So then what is your strategy for, for your products? Um, Simon Wardley has been publishing an amazing series of things on, on strategy. So I'll just like, how to get to strategy in 10 steps. He posted this a couple of days ago. Um, the plot on the left is a value chain, right? So this is the, what the customer sees, and then the technologies that form a stack behind that that you need to build all the way to the bottom. And across the bottom, it's the evolution. So it goes from gene Genesis, which is a brand new thing that has never been built before. And that's pretty close to the top, because that's what the customers, are, uh, it's quite close to the customers. All the way through to the bottom, you're using, you know, electricity out of the wall. That's something that is very evolved. It's just a utility. Yeah, there's no differentiation in, ha in, in having an electrically powered computer, right? Yeah, there's, the, 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 there's things like data centers. Uh, uh, yeah, this is why people tend to do startups on AWS, because owning your own data center is not a place to differentiate, right? Particularly for a startup. It's a, it's a utility thing. It's down on the bottom right in this curve. It's already evolved to the thing where you just buy it off the shelf. You buy compute capacity, and you layer things on top of it. And then the, the, that's step three. It's a 10-step thing. Step eight is a sort of modified form of this map where you divide what you're doing into three different sections. And there's the pioneers, is the, is the pieces where you're brand, building something brand new. This is the differentiating thing for what you're building. In the middle is the settler piece, which is you're using the latest state-of-the-art services from everyone else. Right? You, you just accumulate stuff. You, everything's API-driven nowadays. You buy stuff in. You don't you know, custom build your own sat, flash chips out of, out of sand. Right? You go and buy them off. <laughs> you, you buy them from a, from a vendor. Right? And on the right, the town planners, this is stuff where you're just optimizing and tuning and trying to get the best possible deal. Um, they call it town planners. So it's pioneers, settlers, and town planners is one way of thinking about it. 
the town planners, you're doing Six Sigma projects to get it to be absolutely rock solid and incredibly cheap, and it's very, very predictable and well understood. The stuff on the left is agile development, incredibly, you, you're trying things out all the time and you're iterating really fast. And the stuff in the middle is just you know, state of the art and you may hop around a little bit. Um, these maps, uh, there's a guy, Simon Wardley has been writing about this. Uh, there's a guy that started putting together Simon's stuff into a book and has built a tool and is off doing little training things on it. So he's got this wardleymaps.com site. It, it, Simon isn't actually associated with wardleymaps.com, but there's a tool being built. Okay, so now you've got a strategy for, how you're going, for what you're going to build and the pieces you're going to build, the pieces you're going to you, you know, consume from somebody else, right? There's lots and lots of off-the-shelf components that you're going to combine together plus a piece of your own secret source. That's what this strategy, that's why you need to map it. Okay, so you figure that out. The next thing is you're going to have to plan your pitch. And there's uh, four books here that I'd, I'd go for. The first one is the, the collected writings of Simon Wardley are on his blog and then somebody's been, this guy's been, I forgot, Peter something or other, has been putting into this um, community book called um, The Future is Predictable. So get your strategy right. And then you want to execute, which means you have to be able to do agile product development in a very sophisticated way. You have to be able to feedback what's going on, right? Um, Reinertsen, Donald Reinertsen is just one of the best people for this. This is a very, very detailed book. It's, it's um, the whole continuous delivery um, ideas are built on top of this principles of product development flow. So this is how you get to execute. You use ideas in here for how you're going to execute, how fast you can get stuff done, how to think about where you spend your time and your money. Okay, so you've got the strategy, you've got your execution planned, now you need to tell the story. Um, Weissman's book, Presenting to Win. If you read this book, you find that he was the guy who helped the, write the pitches that were taken to VCs for some interesting companies, like Cisco. One of the first ones he did was Cisco's pitch, the initial pitch that got their initial investment. He worked with Reed Hastings on Netflix, when Netflix went to market to raise money, um, and I think, again, when they went to IPO as well. So he does the sort of... Those pitches that you do when you're doing initial launch and then again when they do IPO. So he's worked with lots of companies and it, the book is very, very detailed about what are you trying to get the audience to do, right? You're trying to leave them with an idea, you're trying to lead them to, yes, I need to give you money, right? And, and so it's very much about telling your story and being very concise about it. But it's, it's the book, the stylistic uh, techniques it uses, it's not very pretty, it's sort of old style PowerPoint. Um, presentation Patterns, a much more recent book with lots of very detailed guidelines in how to do things. There's technical details of how to make, how to use PowerPoint and how to use Keynotes to do some fairly sophisticated things that look pretty. So it's full of, I mean, you can polish, you make your slide deck look really, really good, right? And it's, it's an it's a ex extremely good book. It's largely about software development um, and, you, and the sort of talks you see at conferences. Um, the, the standard conference, it's a standard presentation. There are names for all the patterns, and they're quite funny names. Um, the, the, the name for the common pattern you see is the bullet-ridden corpse. That is a presentation that is just bullet, 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 and it's called the bullet-ridden corpse pattern, and that is the one that everyone uses because PowerPoint just does those, right? So it's how to avoid generating a bullet-ridden corpse as your, as your initial presentation. It's a very entertaining book, so just get these four, understand them, you know, there are other, the other books that Steve put up are, are much more about how to run it and, and think about operating it. So, you've done this, you've got a nice shiny pitch. Um, the first thing is don't take the first, as soon as you finish it, don't go rushing off and find a VC. Try it out on your friends, try it out on the other members of the team, your co-founders, anyone you can find, because what you will find is it's probably about twice as long as it should be. And there's this quote, which was both, both by Blaise Pascal and Mark Twain. I didn't have time to write you a short letter, so I wrote you a long one, right? And, and it takes time and iterations to compress your ideas and to get the flow and to get the story arc and to make it compelling. And you find that it gets less and less wordy and more and more, a, a stronger and stronger, more compelling pitch. So practice it and tune it, and then when you go to one of your existing friends in the VC community, they go, oh, that's a cool pitch, right? You've got, a, you've got it going. So 
you're doing this pitch multiple times. So the first thing you're doing is doing it, I mean, you're funding the idea, right? And this is usually sort of less than 100K worth of, of dollars. So angel money, maybe there's a little bit of seed money that comes in um, at very early stage. But typically, you're self-funding something to come up with an idea. Um, that, you know, you, you, might, you may, not, may or may not need money to do that. The next thing is the initial product, and most seed rounds are somewhere sort of around a million, you know, maybe half a million to a million and a half. If you get much above, uh, a, much above a million, it's usually a bit too big to be a seed round. So just giving you some idea for, uh, for the kind of scope here. Um, once you've built, that's where you build the initial product. You've got a prototype, you've got one or two sample customers, you've got a bit of feedback, everything's at alpha stage. Then you go, okay, we've got the alpha, We've got, it's in the hands of two or three people. We've got their feedback. You put that together in another pitch, and you go for the A round, right? This is where you say, OK, I now need to take this to market. I'm going to come out of beta. I'm going to come out of stealth. I'm going to launch the product. And we're going to pretty much handhold it into the initial set of customers, maybe the first 10, 20 customers. If it's an enterprise kind of product, uh, if it's consumer, then you know, it's a little bit different. But if in enterprise, this would be the first few tens of customers, where you start getting a little bit of, will they actually pay for it kind of thing. You start playing around with the cost pricing models, figuring out how do you sell it, who do you sell it to, how much will they, can you charge for it. You start discovering what your real competition is. Once you validate it in the market, and that's usually a few single digit million, say, you know, five million or something like that, to do that. And you've got to, you start, you hire your first sales guys at that point. If that looks like it's working, you, then it's the, okay, you've got a repeatable sales model. If I go to a customer, I make this pitch, they buy this much. And every time I add another sales rep, it, my, my sales go up, right? The sales reps have a repeatable model that they can take to market. When you get to that point, you're into a growth stage. It's a B or a C round or whatever. Um, and then you can get tens of millions raised. And you put those tens of millions primarily into your sales force, and they just start hoovering up customers, and that's when you've got, you're worth hundreds of millions, and that's, you know, you get the, the nice billion dollar exit. Every VC wants to see a billion dollar exit, and it's just kind of the shorthand for, it would be nice, right? Um, you're not always gonna get that. You may crap out at 100 million, you know, you may sort of get bought or just, just, just stumble along the way. So there's lots of different w outcomes, but what, what they'd like to see is, you know, a path that gets you to, um, you know, hundreds of millions of revenue and, you know, a billion dollar valuation. That's, that's a nice exit for a, for a VC. And you can IPO or you can get bought by Cisco or VMware or somebody like that. That kind of thing. So that's sort of to give you some idea of the scale of the phases when people are talking about A rounds, if you haven't run into that. And this is very, very flexible. I mean, this, this is just to give you some idea of the orders of magnitude. Okay. so. I've got sort of one, one last point, which is how do you stay alive during this? Um, the VC is a partner in this. They see lots of patterns. They've seen it go wrong before, and you're just try, they will give you lots of ideas. They'll say, OK, this is the burn rate that makes sense for your kind of company. This is how much contingency money you need to keep on one side. This is when you should be going and raising money. You're too early. You're too late. There's lots of patterns. So use the VC community and, your, and whoever's on your board as to listen to their pattern input, right? They, see the, they don't necessarily understand exactly the technology or what you're building or exactly how you're going after it, but there are, there are very, very common patterns that go across startups. So another thing is um, you, deals can go away right up until the dollars are in the bank. Like you can have a signed term sheet, you can have everything lined up, you can be... You know, everyone's celebrating, and unless the dollars are actually there in that bank account, it can disappear. There, there is lots of stuff that can go wrong right to the end. People have walked away from signed deals in the past. So, you know, don't bank on it until it is really in the bank. And the other thing, which is a little counterintuitive, is that you should raise money when you don't need it. It's much easier to raise money. You'll get a better deal if you raise money um, when you aren't actually desperate to, to need the money. Right. It, it sounds a little counterintuitive because when you really need money, it's actually quite hard to raise it because you're a little bit desperate. You won't get such a good deal, and you'll have to accept a lower valuation, and you may actually not get it, and then you flame out, and you run out, and you lay everyone off, and you're done. Right? So I'm not quite sure why this thing is crapping out. No, it's all right. It's coming back now. Um, there's some bad connection somewhere in here. 
All right. And then just, uh, this, is, this is a sad fact here. You are probably going to fail, especially if this is the first time you've done it. But make sure you, you, everyone sees you learning from your failures and developing your skills and build trust, and you'll get a second chance, right? If you end up, if you, if you get too invested in the first one, even, you know, and it's going to go off the rails, and you just get too tied up in it, and then you can sort of start screwing around, then, then you'll, you'll break the trust, right? So you need to be very straightforward and um, make sure you're learning all along, all along the way. And you know, then, you, then you're an experience. Even if your first company didn't make it, the second time around you're, you're an experienced entrepreneur, you get another chance. Because quite often it's the second or third time that people actually get, get big. So I haven't talked about HPC at all. So just a few things generally, talk, thinking about the HPC space. Yeah, HPC, high performance. You've got large scale. You've got, you've got bleeding edge technologies. You're solving problems that are beyond what most enterprises need. So once you've figured out how to solve that problem, a little bit later on, these problems turn up in, in the leading edges of enterprises. So there is this transition where you can take something that's been solved in HPC and take it to mainstream markets. That's a standard pattern, right? That's something that you can look for and VCs will see, right? That's a, a you know, are you one of those guys? Um, the other thing is bringing consumer and enterprise tech into VC, into HPC, like the uh, Uber Cloud stuff that, um, that Wolfgang's been working on, um, you know, they're bringing Docker into HPC. That's an, something that came up in the enterprise space. It's, a, it's an interesting technology. They're, using, they're leveraging these technologies and bringing it into the HPC market. So those are the sort of interesting. And the other thing is there is a huge shortage <coughs> of data science people, people that can do it analytics. And generally speaking, the HPC market is full of people that are mathematically, statistically literate, physics, You've got a lot of expertise that you can tap into. And that's, you may be, you know, you might be an MPI or an OpenMP programmer. Well, it's not really that big an enterprise, but if you can figure out how to translate that into Spark and R and, um, you know, Python or whatever the, you know, whatever the, the data science people want, you know, Hadoop, you're, you're translating a, a very difficult to learn skill set, which is that you're, math, you're you know, numerate, basically, you, and you can do analytics and you can solve hard math problems into a space where there is a huge shortage of, of people. So deep learning, all of the neural network stuff, all of those kinds of things, anything like that, um, and you know, the sort of sophisticated uh, data modeling. That's, that's where there's a, a big gap and there's a lot of transitional uh, opportunities, I think. So that's basically what I've got. Um, I've been doing lots of talks over the last, um, over the last year. And I, what I've mostly been talking about is speeding up development. And the most recent talk I did was about lowering the cost of cloud, uh, basically. But you know, I've got lots of presentation slides and lots of videos that don't, you know, not on this topic, obviously, but on the technology of doing continuous delivery and speeding things up. Um, and then there's this book. If, you want to, if you're trying to get into the enterprise space right now, this is the most fundamental book, Lean Enterprise. This is what's really happening. Enterprises are adopting continuous delivery DevOps and Lean Startup at scale. And this is quite incredible. The Department of Homeland Security is now an agile shop. They can get stuff done in days to weeks, right? You go, really? <laughs> this used to take them a year to do the simplest thing. They're now going incredibly quickly, and they are running the Netflix Chaos Monkey in production. If you know what that is, don't worry about it. But the, I, was this, I was in the audience, and the guy from the DHS, the CIO, said, yeah, we're running Netflix-style code in production. I went, wow. <laughs> right? So Target are doing it, Macy's are doing it, the big banks are doing it. So there's a lot of interest right now in, in there's a huge technology reboot going on in enterprise. So this is one of the investment theses that Battery has is, what do we need for that? All right. I've got five more minutes. This is our, you know, we have teams in um, Boston, Menlo Park, and Israel. Um, list of contacts there. Bit of Q&A for five minutes, and then I'm done. Oh, thank you. We have more than five. All right, we've got some Q&A. Yeah. Please repeat the question because the sure. will not hear it. 
Yeah, so the question is, is what's more interesting, bringing HPC to enterprise or enterprise to HPC? Uh, I think the enterprise market's bigger, and most VCs are more com comfortable with that. So if you've got a technology you've developed in the HPC space and you're bringing it into enterprise, that's probably going to be an easier sell. Um, leveraging it in the opposite direction, um, you're mostly selling into, you know, where, where is the big dollars in, in HPC? I mean, there's the sort of government research labs which buy stuff, and then there's the, um, the sort of CAD stuff, right? People designing cars and all those kinds of things. So sort of technology in that space, I guess, weather forecasting, all those kinds of things. So those markets are a little bit difficult. They t particularly government, if you're trying to sell into government markets, they're really slow purchasing. Right, so you want to do selling into enterprise. You want it's easier because the uh, the sales cycle is typically more predictable and shorter. Selling it, selling to a research lab where they're planning something for a year or two in the future is much harder. So those are, those are the kinds of things to think about. We, you know, what is the typical sales cycle of the people you have to sell to? An important consideration. Do you want me to ask a question? All right, another one. Yep. The factors from a services company versus a product company. We, we, so batteries invested in company you know, hardware and software all across the way. We've got a lot of interest in uh, flash storage, for example. There's, that's hardware, obviously. And then there's some software layering in that. Um, there's a company called Diablo. I think they'll be at supercomputing. They do a, an in-memory system DIM. So it's, you know, it goes in alongside your, 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 your 32 gigabyte DIM. You put 400 gigabyte flash DIM in. So it's incredibly fast, incredibly low latency. It moves you on from being an IO bus thing to being a memory bus thing. So that's a disruptive change in the, in the flash space, right? It's faster, it's cheaper in some ways, and it's um, lower latency. So that's, that's an interesting move. Um, they've got a long roadmap of interesting things they're going to be doing. So that's. That's um, taking advantage of one of these um, investment theses that things, you know, once you've got flash, I mean, you can't really stick a hard drive on, an on a DIM. That's not going to work, right? So this is something that you could not have done in a sensible way until you got really high-density flash. On the services side, really everything's being replaced with as a service. We're selling into healthcare, the finance, um, we've got an accounting SaaS company. We've got a physical therapy SaaS company. We've got um, now food delivery, uh, sort of one that does optimizes uh, public transport routing. You know, there's all kinds of things that are being done as a service, uh, um, as well as the sort of enterprise IT stuff. So, like Vivid Cortex is a uh, MySQL performance monitoring tool as a service. Right? You just load the agent, it talks back to their central server, you log into it with your web browser, you're done. You don't have to go and install a system to monitor and tune up your MySQL. So that's, that's kind of the standard pattern that, that um, you're seeing just about everything done as a service now. So, the, yeah, I guess the question is um, about attitudes to being a, an HPC company versus a big data company. If you do the same thing, call it big data, you're going to get further. It, it does matter what you call things. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, you're, you're setting up a whole lot of perceptions. A lot of people have invested over the years in you know, supercomputers that, you know, it was like the Dead Architecture Society meeting was yesterday, right? It's, you know. Um, 
So Calzada in, in particular, I was very interested in that. I think there's timing. So you can get in a market too early. Calzada was probably a year or two early. The 64-bit ARM chips hadn't quite come out. Um, that's going to be a really interesting space maybe in another year or so. So there's a lot of it around timing. And you can be too early or too late, or you can just get it right. And it's very hard to tell whether the market's going to come to you and whether your supply chain is going to deliver the things you need, like 64-bit you know, ARM chips in this case. You know, were they really a thing? They were going to be a thing two years ago. They didn't quite make it. So um, I think that's an example of timing. But yes, there's definitely, uh, if you're trying to sell to a VC firm, that, you're going, that your primary market is within HPC, that's a much harder sell than the other way. Right, then say, I'm, I'm, I've learned something in HPC, how to do a big data kind of thing, and I'm going to apply that to the general enterprise market, which is maybe 10 or 100 times bigger. Right? So it's about how hard it is to sell into that space, who are the buyers, and how hard is it to turn around those, those purchases. Right? And there's a lot of bad experiences in trying to sell supercomputers, because you know, Livermore Labs buy one, and then you're done. That's it. Right? <laughs> it's a classic problem. One yep. more question. All right. So talking about talent shortages in, in HPC and being able to package that talent as a service and then provide it to the rest of the community, something like that? 